Hello Dave is brought to you ad-free by my supporters on Patreon. Become a Patreon yourself and get your name listed as a supporter at the end of every video by following the link in the video description. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Hello Dave with a down-to-earth astronomy. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. Let's have a look at what's been going on in Leet and in space. And wow, has space been an interesting place this week. But before we head out there, let's just have a quick look at Elite Dangerous because it haven't been dull there either. Frontier, of course, announced that they are going to launch a new patch on the 23rd of April. And it's going to be mainly focusing around the new player stuff. And there's also going to be some quality of life updates. So this is pretty much exactly what Frontier has promised us um, previously. That the patches we're going to see this year is going to be fairly small. In the beginning, they're going to focus on the new player experience. Maybe put in a few quality of life updates. Um, which is exactly what they're doing. I'm not going to dive into too much detail with it because there is actually quite a bit. Um, I did a video on it last week, um, I believe on Wednesday actually, where I went over it in a lot more detail and gave my views on it. So you can go and you can find the video if you want more detail on it. But I just have a few comments I want to attach to this. First of all, it seems now that this has given some time and people begin to uh, um, to, uh, to look at the, uh, the, the info they put out. That It mostly... Um, it's mostly a um, a positive uh, thing. People, people are mostly receiving it positively, at least. And after I've been been thinking about it a little bit more, I think sure it is. It is. It it's a, it's a, okay. It's a positive thing. That I think they're doing. I mean, it, the things they're adding into the game. It's not taking anything away from what the game is. So if you if you're not interested in the new assistance modules like the Super Cruise or the new docking computer, stuff like that, well, you could just keep on flying as you always will. And sure, that's the point that people are making that it's going to mean that people are going to... Um, it's going to be f flying their ship less because it's going to be flying itself, basically. And the game will then take a step more in the direction of what X4 is, which is basically a micromanagement game where you don't really fly the ship as much as you just manage them and say where they go and then do it automatically. And and I guess there's a fair point in that, but there's nothing, there's no one like preventing you from taking your ship and flying it manually. I, for one, I'm probably not going to bother much with these modules. Of course, I'm going to give them a go. I'm going to try them out, see what they're all about. But overall, I'm probably not going to spend a whole lot of time and I'm probably not going to recommend including it in my builds because those modules, I mean, is often something I would see I could find a lot better use for than fitting stuff like that. But I can see how it can help players in uh, in the early games. And then, of course, when they begin to get hooked into the game and they need to make a little bit more... I wouldn't call it competitive, but a little bit more effective builds. Um, they would have to begin to get rid of those modules and actually learn how to dock the ship and fly it in super cruise manually. Um, so I think overall it's um, it's a positive um, it's a positive um, positive patch, and it's also nice to see the they would have to begin to get an idea of the size of the patch. Frontiers always said these patches were going to be really really small, and it is a small patch, no no doubt about that. But I actually expected it to be um, to be a lot smaller than it was. I would have maybe expected that, okay, now we're going to get a patch and they would just add just like the, the modules, right? Or just the new player zones and revamp of the training stuff or just the quality of life update. But we're getting all these things at the same time. So they actually have, um, they're actually a bit bigger than I expect them to be, which is, again, um, I'm positively surprised here. So overall... Um, I'm actually seeing this as a as a, as a pretty uh, pretty decent patch. I mean, again, okay, expectations were really, really was really low because Frontiers basically told us you're not going to get a lot or anything at all until 2020. So the fact that we're getting something is is great. Um, I'll of course be sure to uh, to check it out um, and also check out the new player zone and stuff like that when uh, once it's out. So, but again, that's going to be sometimes uh, sometimes down the road. But let's quickly move on. Let's talk about space because space has been uh, been busy. It's been crowded out there this week. Um, first of all, of course, the Event Horizon Telescope has um, well, the pictures have been existed for quite a while, but the pictures have now been published that is they're taken of uh, a direct image of a of a black hole. So you may all have seen it. This picture here. It's it's basically a, a very close up picture of uh, Mesa eighty seven 
which is a um, it's an elliptical galaxy. It's a very big uh, elliptical galaxy. It's one of the biggest in our local group. Um, is it actually part of the local group? I'm not 100 percent sure. It's pretty close, galaxy distances wise. <laughs> um, and it's interesting. I think the reason why they picked this one specifically is because it's what's called an uh, AGN galaxy or active galactic nucleus. Um, and that means that the black hole in the middle of that galaxy is still active. Active meaning there's still material falling onto the black hole, meaning that it's going to emit a lot of like light and a lot of kind of stuff as the material is being spun up very quickly um, in a disk and the increasing disk around the black hole. Um, I think that's why they picked this one, because it is still an active and it's a very active galaxy. Um, our own black hole is pretty much dormant now. There's not a lot of material. Um, one of my old um, professors, she always described black holes as basically being like a big baby. It just sits there and it eats everything it can reach. And once there's nothing to uh, to eat anymore, it just sits there and waits for something else to come within reach. And as soon as it comes within reach, it eats it up. Uh, that's that's pretty much how black holes work. And our black hole in the Milky Way is pretty much eating everything there is. Um, Mesa eighty seven still have some uh, some stuff lying around it that it can uh, that it can. Uh, um, um, that could fall onto the black hole, which makes it um, rather interesting. Now, the picture, of course, some people I think were, were a little disappointed. I don't know what they were expecting, something like what you saw on Interstellar or something like that. But the reason why this is such a big deal is because you need to remember the way that you, we progress in science. The way you would often do it is you would um, start by, yeah, well, it's a kind of a cycle thing, so you can start anywhere. You could make an assumption about how something works, right? So I could guess that um, uh, gravity is a good good, uh, good example. Like one of the first theories of gravity was that thing fell towards the ground because that was, the, that was where things liked to be. It was the natural resting place. And then people would go out and... Um, and they would make uh, make tests. So, so what you do in science is you you make an assumption about how something works. You make a theory, and based on theory, you make a you make a prediction. You take that prediction, and you then need to go out and verify this with an experiment. And once that experiment then comes back with results, if it fits your theory, if you could predict what that experiment should be then that's one point for your theory. You can then use that theory to make more predictions, making more experiments, and you keep doing that until one day that that you come up with a prediction using your theory but the real world experiments come back with a different result that you can't explain and then you have to rework your theory and that new rework of the theory needs to not only explain the the new one explained the thing but also all the previous experiments because uh, yeah and, and, and this is where many of like the the flat earth theories and all that kind of stuff just completely fell apart they all have like discrete theories that describe individual um, that describe individual um, uh, phenomenon, but they don't have like a common thing that describes every single at the thing at the same time. Um, but anyway, so we for a very long time, we had an assumption, we had a theory about how black holes work, and we've done extensive computer models on this, how it should look uh, if we took a direct picture of a black hole. But of course, until today, we haven't been able to actually go out and do the experiment. Now, this is often one of the problems with science is that we may not have the technology to go out and do the experiments needed to verify a theory. And that was the case here with the black holes, that we didn't have the technology to go out and take a direct image of a black hole, of course, until last week, when we actually had those images published. And they fit the simulations of it really, really well, um, giving a plus one for the theory of uh, of how black holes work and all that stuff. So that's why this is um, this is such a big deal that we have this uh, blurry image of a black hole. And one last thing I want to attach to this is, um, I can't even remember the exact bandwidth they're recording it in, that I took the picture in, but I am almost certain that it's not visible light. So people have been asking about oh what about the color why is it why is it red is it because of redshift or something like that but no it's it's just the color scheme but the image they get down is basically black and white um it's just like values on a ccd chip they don't do multiple bands and combine the colors um so it's just um it's basically just a black and white image and instead of just showing a black and white they just added another color profile to it 
um, in this case something that looks a little bit like a heat map but it's not the colors that it would actually be it's not even visible light they have detecting they're detecting um so um so so the colors you, you can't really use those for anything it's just the shape of it and the, and the intensity that's the uh, that's the interesting part here but let's uh, let's move on because um a little bit more sad news um israel for sent up a um a moon lunar lander moon lander um, that they were planning to try and land on the surface of the moon, being the, I believe, the fourth country to send a uh, an object and land it on the moon. Um, and so far, I mean, the, the mission went great until, well, it didn't. <laughs> um, no, they were they were doing the descent. They were burning, burning off some of their, uh, their speed and everything was looking good. Um, Suddenly, some of the module, one of the modules that is in charge of uh, the spaceship's orientation and acceleration, which you can imagine is quite important when you're doing a, um, a maneuver burn like that, um, they suddenly failed, and a few seconds later, they lost telemetry, tele uh, telemetry with the um, with the lander. Um, I don't actually know exactly how. I think it was it it felt longer, but it probably was less than it felt like a minute, but it was probably less. Um, but they lost telemetry and when they come back, came back, it, the thing was falling towards the moon very, very rapidly and accelerating. Um, it was basically in free fall and um, and I think they tried to, I mean, they tried to get it back online. They tried to do a, a reboot, basically to reboot and repair. But by the time the thing came back, uh, came back online, um, it was just too late. Uh, thrusters was not powerful enough to stop it and the whole thing crashed into uh, to the surface of the moon and just scattered a million pieces across the surface um so that's really a shame that uh, that, that didn't go i mean every regardless of, of, of where from and who's doing it every time that a space exploration mission fails it's always uh, really a shame because well the more people who spend time and, uh, and effort on exploring space the better at least in my book um but again, I don't think that they have they are hundred percent sure exactly why it failed and what happened. Um, but to me, it looked like a hardware failure. Um, I don't think it was. Um, I don't think it was a software bug. I think this was simply just hardware failing. It might just have been. I mean, the engines have been running for for quite an extensive period of time at that at that point. So I don't know if something overheated or or the maybe there was some. I, I don't know, maybe the engine shook something apart, I don't know. Um, to me, at least, it looked like a hardware failure. It might have been caused by uh, by the uh, the long burning time. Um, I don't know, but hopefully there'll be some news out on the, on that um, later on. Um, and again, more space news. I said it was busy. SpaceX, um, of course, launched yet another of their Falcon Heavy. And um, this time they actually managed to recover all three of the boosters, um, the two side boosters, all three of the yeah boosters, both the two side boosters and the center core. Um, the two side boosters returned to um, to Cape Canaveral. It looked awesome having those two boosters land pretty much simultaneously within a few seconds of each other. Um, and the the core stage, of course, landed on their drone ship out. I think like quite far out actually. Um, also a, a successful landing. I don't believe there was any videos of it. As, as usual, they always have video cut out just as the booster trying to land on the drone ship um, because of the platform beginning to shake around that they lose satellite connection. Um, by the way, they did manage to recover all three of the boosters, which uh, which is also meaning they're going to reuse those on the next uh, Falcon launch. And it's nice to see... Um, it's nice to see... SpaceX becoming better and better at recovering these boosters because at the end of the day that means that they can do launches cheaper if they can reuse the boosters and cheaper the launches probably means that it's more accessible for people to um, to get equipment into space so we could do more science more research um, into space travel and into astronomy um, so again that's absolutely wonderful and um, was really happy to uh, to see that uh, they got all the, all the boosters back I think the last thing that I need to uh, to talk about today is, of course, live streaming tomorrow um, with the news of um, the April update. Um, one thing I actually forgot to mention was that all ships will have additional class one optional internal slots. This uh, all small ships gets two, and all mediums and large ships gets one additional um, optional internal slots. That's going to mean we have we can move around some of the some of the builds. So what I'll be doing on the live stream tomorrow. 
is I will go over some of my ex existing builds. Um, probably go right over some of the mining builds. I'll probably have a look at the cucumber um, and see what this uh, what changes this does to the um, to the builds and if we can move some things around and optimize it a little bit. Especially the cucumber. I mean, I have done some changes since the last video I did on it. Um, so maybe it's about time that I give that thing an, uh, an overhaul, update it, and, uh, and come out with the uh, with an updated build guide for uh, for the cucumber build. Um, so I'm probably going to run over that as well, um, and as I said, run over my mining ships as well. And I also want to go and have a look at potentially building a new um, a new bubble boss, a new camera conda. Um, right now, I spend 80, 90 percent of my time flying around in an anaconda because it just the only ship right now that can carry all the equipment I need for doing all the recordings and in case I need some scanners or anything. Um, this is the only ship I have that that uh, that can carry all that stuff. But with the extra internal slots, we might actually be able to make another build that can do this. Um, and I really want to get out of the Anaconda. I'm tired of it. It's big. It's slow. It can't boost. At least not the build that I have. I could make it boost, but... I want to see if I can't do something to get a little, something a little bit more exciting to fly other than, uh, than the Anaconda. So um, that's also something I'll be working on. That's probably going to be the last half of the live stream working on, uh, on that. And the first half, we're going to look at some of the existing builds. But anyway, um, I think that's going to be it for this week. I uh, really hope that you, uh, you liked this video. If you did, remember to give it a like down below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And also next time, I will see you guys in space.